Hello everyone! Did you know the first time I started playing Final Fantasy XIV, I ran into a trouble in the character creator? And that was when I came across this screen. Pick a deity. And then you just get 12 symbols. And they just say, hey, have that it? Do some reading? Pick the one that fits you. And at the time, you have no idea, like, does this matter? Is, is this going to change the story? Is this going to change my stat? And I'm just going to tell you right away, it really doesn't matter. It's all for, like, your own roleplay values. But if you need some help, or if you just want to learn a little bit more about the religion of the Twelve, then this video is for you. I'm going to cover who the Twelves are, their creation myth, and the heavens and hell they reside over. There is not going to be any story spoilers, so you can watch the video without worry, no matter where you are in the story. Making it very good for a foundation in the belief of the gods. If you like Final Fantasy XIV lore videos, I do release lore videos every Saturday, so make sure to subscribe. But for now, let's jump into it. Step one is to look at the gods and the creation story. I think it's best to look at both things at the same time. That way we will see how the gods relate, which order they showed up in, and we can talk a little bit about their roles. Now, through the eras, there have apparently been a lot of different creation stories. Thankfully, a scholar from Sherlian spent most of his career just finding all the stories and combining them into one sort of ultimate this is most likely to be the actual story story, so that is what we're going to use. So this is the official creation story of Yorsia, based on the current faith in the game. In the beginning there was neither light nor darkness, only the world. And it was not until Althig emerged thence in his nakedness, did time take his first step forward. With him, the keeper also carried weight, and with weight were the realms of land and firmament defined. And from the beginning we get our first god. First of all, there is this world which is mentioned throughout the creation story. It doesn't define what it is, it seems to be some sort of a state before the creation of everything, and is the place where the gods come from, but we don't know much more about it than that. But we know a little bit about Althic. Althig was the first god created, and he is the keeper of time. Before he showed up, there was nothing. There was no land, there was no sea, there was no time. There was absence of everything, but as he showed up, he brought two things. He brought the passing of time, and he brought the creation of the land. So he created the basis of the land, and is known as a god who can manipulate it. He is, to this day, depicted as an austere emperor, and his symbol is the hourglass. Yet Althig would not be alone for over long, for soon from the world did another step forth. Her name was Nymea, and she was but a mewling babe, could not but weep, and soon her tears created vast lake. Althig's seeking companionship in the empty realm of his creation took the young goddess under his wing and cared for her as one would a daughter. And here we have Nymea the spinner. She is the goddess of fate, the creator of the lakes, and the watcher of the celestial bodies. She is usually depicted as a weaver wearing white silk, and her symbol is the spinning wheel. As we notice from the story, she comes from the same place as Althig, and they are generally spoken of as siblings, though it also seems that Althig sort of raised her. But don't worry, their relationship is going to get a noticeably more complicated when we keep on reading, because as Nymea grew, however, so did their love for one another until it could no longer be contained, culminating in a divine coupling which resulted in the birth of two holy daughters, Asima the sun and Manfina the moon, and with their advent was day and night conceived. And here we go, there is no good creation myth without a little bit of incest. So no matter if Althig is viewed as Nymea's dad or her brother, the two of them decided to make babies together. And they made Asima the Warden, which is the Keeper of the Sun, and Goddess of Inquiry, or just curiosity. She is depicted as a noble lady holding a golden fan, and her symbol is the sun. And then is her sister, Menfina the Lover, which is the Goddess of Love, but also Keeper of the Twin Moons. 
I know we say twin moons because there used to be two moons. There is just one moon now because the other one fell to the ground, thanks to the Garleans. But so you still keep her off the twin moons. So her symbol is the twin moons, even though one of the moons decided to land on our planet, um, is still the twin moons. She is depicted as a young maid carrying around skillet. So with these gods, we have some water, we have some earth, we have the passing of time, and we have the day-night cycle with the sun and the moon. Absolutely lovely. And here we have the building blocks of light. And so we continue. So did countless cycles of light and darkness pass, before from the world once again did another step forth. Thaliak, bearer of wisdom and knowledge, looked upon the silent and unchanging lake left by Nymea's tears, and coaxed from it a river to carry the water to the far corners of the realm. And here we have Thaliak the scholar. He is the ruler of rivers, but he is also the god of knowledge. And for that reason, he is actually the guardian deity of Sierleyen, a city-state focused on knowledge and research. He is depicted as a scholar holding an ashen staff, and his symbol is the scroll. And this is actually my deity of choice. That is, after I finish the Realm Reborn, because before that, I just picked the one that I could associate with my birth month. We'll cover that a little bit later. But this is the one I ended up picking, because I felt it related the most to me. So now we have rivers all over the place, and on we go. Asima was drawn to Thaliak's secrecy. Professor loved the new deity, and he got him two daughters. The first being Limelen, who took the water created by her grandmother, and expended it into the world seas. The second daughter was the lonely Nofika, who, wanting for companionship, created her own playmates, and thus brought life into the world. So here we have Limelen the Navigator, the goddess of the seas and navigation. She is the guardian deity of Limsolominsa, which is one of our starting cities. She is usually depicted as a strong fishy woman, wielding a long bladed harpoon. And her symbol is the wave. But she is the navigator, so if you are ever out on the sea, that is the god you pray to. Her sister, Nofika the Matron, on the other hand, is the goddess of abundance, of soil and harvest, and is usually the patron deity of farmers. She is also the guardian deity of Credania, and was the god I picked as I started the game, simply because she is connected to the 11th month of the year, and my birthday is in November, so it just kind of made sense to me. She is depicted as a jubilant farmer holding a scythe of steel, and her symbol is the spring leaf. And with this, we got life filling the world. We got the rivers, we got the oceans, we got the land, we got the day-night cycle, and we got life. Things are really good. But we are not done with the gods, because we have to have 12 of them. So on we go. It was not until life had spread throughout the land, and newly created seas, that a new god appeared. Though whence the other did not know, for the world lay dormant. His name was Ochun, and where he wandered did towering mountains arise, from level plains. With the formation of these spires did cold wind flow from high down to the warm seas and back up again, carrying life that was once reserved for land and water into the skies. Here we have Ochen the Wanderer, ruler of the mountains, the god of wanderers and vagrants. He's usually depicted as a carefree ranger, wielding a bow of yew, and his symbol is the walking stick. Based on how much we travel in the game, he would actually be a very fitting god for most of us. But by this point, we have a lot of gods that like to change the environment, and that is not going to be so great. So, those winds that bring love into the heart of Limelen. Yet those he longed to be with Ochon, his wanderlust prevented the two from ever being joined over long. And lo, did they never beget children of their own. This was a time of great creation but great chaos. Ochen's mountain rose and fell at his whims, Thaliak's rivers flowed hither and thither, and Limelen's seas were expanded, swallowing entire swatches of land before the gods even knew they were gone. To bring order to this chaos, Nymea pried forth a mighty comet from the heavens, and gave it life, directing it down into the world that it may destroy the excess 
verstands and daughters had wrought, while bringing harmony once again to the realm. And with this, we actually get Ralg the Destroyer. He is the common. I think that it was kind of funny because to help the chaos, because everything was too chaotic, we gave a comet sentient life, like a personality and thought, and then she threw it at the planet <laughs> to reset everything, I guess. And it did work. It Things calmed down. Order was made, and a new god was born in Ralg the Destroyer, because he was the comet. He is the breaker of worlds and god of destruction. And today, he's also the guardian deity of Alamigo. He is depicted as a magi carrying a staff of bronze, and his symbol is the striking meteor. What I gotta say is, this is a pretty intense start to a life, but not so bad. And for many days and night, the world was calm, and the gods content in the order was now reign supreme. That is until the world woke from his slumber, and back and forth two final deities, Bairgot and his younger sister Halon. It was feared that the untamed and ambitious siblings might once again usher chaos onto the world. So to see to that they were properly disciplined, Nymea quickly made them wards of Ralgar the Destroyer. So, because she did not want chaos, he handed them over to the guy who blew up everything. Now the gods we just got is Pyrogat the Builder, who is the god of industry, art and architecture. He is the creator of buildings and structures, and is depicted as an ardent smith with two-headed hammer, and his symbol is the hand. While almost the complete opposite is Halon the Fury, who is the goddess of glaciers and war. She is the guardian deity of Iskart and is depicted as a great warrior with a great shield. And her symbol is the three spears. And while to me Halon kinda makes sense for Alg the Destroyer, Pyrogat does not. If anything, this seems to be like the worst father-son pairing ever made. I would instead have paired him with Althig, as Althig is the creator of the lands and keeper of time, not the destroyer of everything, which is really the opposite of what poor Pyrogat is. But on we go. A builder by nature, Pyrogat resented his new stepfather, who could teach him only of destruction, choosing instead to spend most of his time in the tutelage of Thaliac. The scholar bestowed upon his eager student the knowledge he would use to force the tool and techniques of creation. Though more open to her father's teaching, Halone too grew restless, longing to test her strength. An opportunity arose when Ochon invited the young goddess on one of his journeys. It was during these travels that Halone's ambition slowly transformed into the lust for battle. Whilst on the road, she would challenge every creature she met, honing her skill and methodically devising new techniques for killing. When Nofika, mother of life, learned of Halone's wanton destruction of her creation, she was angered beyond words and swore revenge, but the fury ignored the matron's challenge, widening the rift between the two. Ochon, feeling responsibility for this rift, devised a plan to calm Nofika. From with the mountain of his creation, Ochon summoned a fount of magna, which spewed forth onto the land. Upon cooling, the magma took form of the twelfth and final god, the dual aspected Nalthal. With Nalthal, Ochen had provided a god to oversee the souls of those who met their death and provide them with peace in the afterlife. Satisfied that her creation would no longer wander the void aimlessly, Nofika agreed to a truce with Alone. And here we got the final god, which is Nalthal the traitor. These are actually twins represented in a single god, those being the twins Nald and Thal, but Nalthal is the single manifestation of the both. They oversee the underworld and are also the god of commerce, and for this reason they are the guardian deity of Ulda, which is a city that is all based around commerce and coin. They are depicted as a discerning merchant holding a balanced scale, and their symbol is the Kauri, an ancient shell currency. And with the advent of the twelfth and final god was the pantheon complete. But before they could call an end to their toil, there first required a realm in which they could reside and watch over their myriad creation. To this end they created the seven heavens, and to there they did finally retreat, bequeathing the rule of Eorsia to mankind. And that is where the gods are now. 
watching mankind from the heavens. And there's not very much information about the seventh heaven, but we do have quite a bit about the other six. So let's talk about the heavens and hell. There are in total six elements. Fire, water, wind, ice, lightning and earth. And two gods are associated with each one. And each element has heaven and a hell. The belief is that those who are good will go to a heaven associated with their life. And those who are bad will go to a hell associated with their sin. But if you do end up going to one of the hells, you are not doomed to be there forever. After suffering there for probably eternity, or what feels like it at least, you will journey through the remaining five hells. As you reach the seventh hell, you will face a final judgment. Your heart is taken and weighted. If it's heavy with sorrow and repentance, you are sent to one of the heavens. But if it's light, then you are sent to the seventh hell to suffer forever. So at least there is some chance to get better, I guess. But let's talk about the places you could potentially go, either good or bad. Starting with fire. This is the domain of Asima and Nalthal. The heaven is a vast endless city built from the golden bricks forged in the fire of the sun. This beautiful place is the home to those who are fair, honest and philanthropic. But if you're bad, well, in the process of making the golden bricks, there was some rubble that fell down in the pit below. And there in the darkness and burning heat are those who wrongly judged their peer who tricked their customers or, took, or partook in either giving or receiving bribes. Next over is the realm of water ruled by Naimea and Thaliak. The heaven here is a river of knowledge. It's created from a melted star and given the essence of knowledge by Thaliak. In this paradise of water live scholars, inventors, teachers and entrepreneurs. An absolutely lovely place, and I would not mind going there. But from the river would also fall forsaken droplets down into the deep pit below, where they would stagnate into a large lake. And there drown the deceivers, the counterfeiters, the sellers of false medicine and the false prophets. The realm of wind is ruled by Ochon and Limelen. Here is a towering mountain range and endless seas. After all, it is the home of explorers, adventurers, mountain climbers and saints, and those who ever managed to rescue any of these people from peril. And through the beautiful mountains is a soft breeze that gets harsher and harsher the lower you go, until down in the pit below it turns into a violent tempest which will rip your skin from your very bones. And that is where bandits, defilers of land and sea, and pirates suffer for eternity. The realm of ice is ruled by Halon and Menfina. Here is a palace made of ice formed by moonbeams and carved by Halon. This is the home of epic heroes, gallant knights, and benevolent and faithful people. But if you go below into the pit, where the piercing icicles fall from the structures above is nothing but darkness and bitter cold. And here suffer cowards, deserters and adulterers. The realm of lightning is ruled by Ralkur and Barigot. The heaven is a towering clockwork spire built by Barigot with the material from the comet Ralkur arrived in. Here live engineers, architects, revolutionaries and the conquerors of evil. But in the pit below, where the lightning aspected fragments of the comet have fallen down, creating an absolute hell of lightning, suffer the vandals, the slumlords, and the warmongers. And the final realm is the realm of Earth, ruled by Nofika and Althig. For this heaven, Nofika planted a single sapling, and then Althig used his power over time to coax it into growing into the magnificent realm where farmers, naturalists, historians and archaeologists rest. But if you go down and follow the leaves that fall from the tree, you will find a pit 
pool of rotting leaves, and there suffer thieves, defilers of nature, and revisionists who want to hide away the true history. And those are the twelve gods and the heavens and hells associated with them. Honestly, when picking who you want to go with, there is no right or wrong choice, it's not going to affect your gameplay, it's not going to affect your story. So I recommend either picking something that speaks to you or the character you want to be playing, or if you have no idea, do what I did my first time around. I just went with my birth month and figured out which god was associated with it. And if you want to do that, here is the order of the month. For January, we have Halone the Fury. For February, is Menfina the Lover. For those born in March, is Thaliac the Scholar. In April, is Nymea the Spinner. In May, is Limelen the Navigator. And June, Ochon the Wanderer. Those born in July we can go with Byrogoth the Builder. August people can go with Ralg the Destroyer. For September, it's Asima the Warden. October is Nalthal the Traitor. November is Nofrika the Matron. And December is Althik the Keeper. But honestly, whichever god you pick, there's no wrong or right to do it. But that at least is the basics of the gods and their origin story. I will talk more about them in future videos, where we go a little bit deeper into the stories, but that will include some spoilers from later expansions. So if you want to make sure to see those videos, I highly recommend subscribing and of course doing the good YouTube stuff. And if you want to be an absolutely amazing person, share this video with somebody who maybe is confused about the gods of Final Fantasy XIV. But for now, thank you so much for watching and whatever you end up doing, I hope you have a lovely day.